I was netting $1,000 every single month after my payment to Susan, which I'll tell you how I structured my payment to her. After my insurance, my taxes, my vacancy repairs, I was netting $1,000 every single month. So imagine, I go, I'll give you a down payment, but I won't give it to you when we close escrow. I'll give it to you six months later, and then I'll give you another portion of it six months after that. So I accumulate $1,000 in cash flow for six months. Now I've got six grand in cash flow. I take that six grand, pull five grand out of it, hand five grand to her, and that pays down her down payment. Then six months later, I pay another $5,000 out of the cash flow from the property. So I got her closing costs paid for by her. Took over the tenant, so no renovation. I got 0% seller finance, and I didn't have to put any money up front. She allowed me to pay my down payment out of the cash flow of the property. You've recently come out with a book, which I've had the pleasure of reading. It's called, uh, I don't know if the fans or listeners can hear it, see it, but it's called Wealth Without Cash. Really well done book put out by Bigger Pockets. I We're going to get into the book for sure, but before we get into it, I just wanted to hear a couple of personal stories about mm -hmm. you. I wanted to hear first about your father and just how he has influenced your real estate investing. And then I also wanted to hear the F-150 story. So if you could kind of go into both of those, that'd be awesome. Of course. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. I think our job as parents and um, fathers, mothers, all that is to do a better job than our parents did with us, right? Take all the resources that our parents um, captured, went out and executed on, all the education they, they got, all the experience they got, and gave all of that to us to hopefully raise us to another level. Our job is to go and take all of that and then go do the same thing for our kids or for future generations if we decide you know, not to have children. My dad um, did a great job of that, meaning he took my grandfather's life, which was working two jobs, 10 kids in their household, working his guts out at the power plant and then working side jobs as a contractor. My dad took that and said, all right, I'm going to go to college. I'm going to become a CPA. I'm going to go do all these things. But in the same um, process, he said, man, I'm not making enough money, right? My, my, grandfather, my grandfather didn't go to college. My father did go to college. And he's thinking, I'm upgrading, I'm upgrading, I'm upgrading. Well, my dad decided he's got a moonlight as well. And so he started moonlighting. And, um, you know, the one thing my dad never got to, even though he talked about it a lot, he never got to a point where he became a full real estate investor. He talked about real estate all the time. When my dad and I were driving around in his F-150 when I was younger, going to job sites and painting and all that kind of stuff for his moonlighting career, he would talk to me about, Pace, you have to buy real estate. You have to buy real estate. You'd have to buy, you have to buy real estate. My dad would listen to, you know, at the time, cassettes. He would be, had all sorts of things he would listen to. But unfortunately, my, never, my dad never got past the point of just buying real estate for his own personal family. And it was because he was really trading his time for money. And so when I got into my 20s and I started realizing, oh my gosh, I'm doing the same thing my dad was doing, which was trading my time for money. Um, there was a day where I asked my dad, I said, hey, what, what should I do to make more money? And my dad's answer, based on the experience that he had at that point, was work harder, work more hours, put more time in. And I was like, dad, I, I'm working every minute of the day as a contractor. I can't do this anymore. And then I realized that my father um, you know, would talk about real estate a lot, but he never really got into real estate besides buying houses for his own family. And so I made a decision. I said, I have, that's the part of the curse, not the curse, but the, basically the upgrading, the generational upgrades that I have to do. I have to be the one that gets into real estate. And so I made it a goal. Well, guess what? I ended up talking about it for years and years and years as well, all the way until I was 28 years old. And finally, as a contractor, um, I met somebody in my new circle of influence, besides my father, actually grabbed me by the shoulder and said, let me show you how to go get your first deal because I'm watching you work your guts out on my projects. Her name was Bethany Willis. And Bethany says, dude, you should not be a contractor. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't really know anything else. She's like, okay. And that's a good excuse because why? And she really held me accountable. She showed me how to go get my first deal. She showed me where leads came from. She showed me how to comp things. She showed me how to fill out paperwork. And then, um, you know, I got my first deal, which a lot of people heard the bunny story about how I got my first deal and how I helped rehome some ladies' bunnies. And that's how she decided to sell her house to me versus my 30 other competitors on that deal. Can and you all go of that, into that? And, can you go into oh, that yeah. a little bit for our listeners that haven't, aren't familiar with sure, the Sure, sure, sure. So um, 
Bethany, essentially, I had done three jobs for her as her contractor. So I was flipping her houses. And I had a big, massive crew. My, my main customers were Open Door, OfferPad, and Zillow. I was a big contractor. So I put in a lot of hours, built a good sized company. Bethany Willis hires me because I have a good reputation around town. I use social media to broadcast, hey, I'm a contractor. I'm doing these things. Here's my before, here's my after. Anyway, she finds me, hires me. I do two jobs for her successfully, on time, on budget. She calls me, hey, I've got another house that I want to flip. Um, come meet me at the house for a bit. Cool. I go to the house. I'm parked in front of the house. I'm there 30 minutes early, catching up on text messages, et cetera. Bethany pulls up behind me, knocks on the glass on my door, is like, get out of your truck. Come sit on the back of this tailgate. So she pulls, opens up my tailgate, sits next to me, and she grabs me by the shoulder. I, I can still remember feeling it dig into my right shoulder as she grabbed me by the shoulder. I can feel her talons, essentially. And she said, why aren't you in real estate? And I said, I, I am in real estate. Look at all these houses I'm flipping. She's like, no, you are not in real estate. You are a service provider to people who are in real estate. And it was like a punch to the gut. And then she, you know, was critical of a lot of other people in that think they're in real estate. Um, she said, you are as replaceable as a mobile notary to a real estate transaction. You can be replaced with a simple Google search. How, new co contractor, Mesa, Arizona, I can replace you in five minutes. Guess who can't be replaced is the real estate investor, the person who owns the asset. I control the ship. I direct where it goes, both good and bad right? If I make money, it's all on me. If I lose money, it's all on me. And she even pointed out to me, she sa I said, so what should I do? Get my real estate license? She's like, ha, no. A real estate license is actually a deviation from going and becoming a real estate investor. You will brainwash yourself into just going out and getting listings and again, becoming a service provider. You are not a real estate investor unless you own the asset. I'm like, okay, well, how do I do that? And she told me how to send out postcards. And I, th this is a long story I won't go into. It's very nuanced, but I'll be very succinct here. She taught me how to send out postcards, which I don't do anymore. It's very expensive to do that. Um, but I sent out postcards. This is about nine years ago. And I got my first couple of leads, missed the first two phone calls from my inbound calls. People got my postcard sitting on their counter when they got home from work. And they go, oh, I, yeah, I do want to sell my house for cash. I'll call you. I missed the first two calls. And the reason I missed the first two calls is because I was literally installing somebody else's toilet in one of their flips. Mm -hmm. And what does that tell you? What does that tell you? When opportunity is smacking me in the face, I still couldn't even answer the phone call. And why was that? It's because I was putting my hands on somebody else's projects and I was serving them and their business and, and uh, convincing myself that I was in real estate. I wasn't. I was a service provider. So I get home that night after missing the first two phone calls. My wife, she says, hey, how's the, have you gotten any calls yet? And I go, yeah, I had two calls come in today, but I missed them because I was doing X, Y, and Z. And she's like, oh, sweetheart. And she was really nice and sweet about it. She goes, but you need to call them. And I go, yeah, I'll call them tomorrow. And she points out to me, Patrick, Pace, when we go out to dinner and you call a restaurant ahead of time and you say, what's the wait? If they say any more than 10 minutes, you are immediately saying, thank you, we'll call somebody else. So do you think these people that called you today are gonna wait for you to call them tomorrow? Or do you think they've called the next postcard or the next letter? I'm like, that's a really freaking great point. So I go, all right, I'm gonna call them. And I, I, I go to call them and boom, my phone starts ringing with another lead. Okay, and the, what, how do I know it, it was a lead? I knew it was a lead because I set my postcards up to forward a phone number to me and I programmed that phone number in my phone as postcard lead. Okay, so every time somebody would call off my postcards, it would pop up on my phone saying postcard lead. I pick up the phone, I answer the phone, and it's a lady named Janie Munson, my first deal I ever got. So I'll spoil the, the plot for you. And uh, Janie Munson says, hey, I, I'm a retiring school teacher. I need to sell my house. I'm going to retire from you know Arizona, and I'm going to go live in Oregon where my family is and um, have more people around me that I know and you know blood relatives, et cetera. I need to sell my house. I go, okay. I didn't even know what to do. I didn't even know how to set the appointment. Like the, people look at me now and they go, oh yeah, it must be nice. Dude, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. She, Bethany Willis had to force me to send out postcards. I missed the first two phone calls. I didn't even know how to set the appointment. I literally put Janie Munson, the lady who just called me, on hold 
so I could call Bethany Willis and say, how do I set the appointment? That's how stupid I was. And I'm saying that to give everybody permission here that it's, it's not just okay, it is a requirement for success for you to go and do things you don't know how to do in order to learn them. So Bethany tells me how to go set the appointment. I go up and I'm driving up to the house. I realize, you know, this is the next day now I'm going up to the house to meet with Janie Munson. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't like, I don't know what to pay for this house. I don't know anything about comping. And I, so who do I call? I call Bethany Willis. Bethany Willis tells me, you got to buy the house for $150,000 or less in order to make money. Okay. So I get to the house. I'm talking to Janie Munson. And I, you know, we kind of walk through the house to the kitchen. We kind of meander th to the kitchen as you do. And there's a stack of postcards. There's a stack of um, letters. There's a stack of um, real estate agent business cards all in her counter. And she's got notes on them. And she, I'm like, wow, she's like really interested in selling her house. And um, I look at all this stuff. And the first thing that came to mind was a very important question that I ask every seller now or my team now ask every seller. And the question was, wow, Janie, what's kept you from selling the house so far? What are you looking for that you weren't able to get with all these other people? And Janie says, well, I have an offer. And I need to get a higher offer than what I currently have. And I go, what's that offer? She says, $165,000, which is $15,000 more than what Bethany Willis told me I could pay as my max offer. So I told Janie, I don't know if I can help you. I think you should probably sell to one of these other people. I think you should take 165. She says, you're not even going to give me an offer. I go, no, how, how can I? My offer is way lower than where you know you need to be. And you're a retiring school teacher. This is your last asset. You deserve to sell this for as much as you possibly can. I can't be that person. Um, I'm way, way too low to even give you an offer. She thought it was a sales strategy. She thought I was sitting there trying to manipulate her, anchor her. And so she says, okay, well, I guess what, what do we do? I go, I, I guess I leave. That's all I, that's all I knew to do. So I'm leaving the house and, um, I'm in the front, th front door threshold and I turn to her and I go, Hey, is there anything I can do to help you, you know, on your move, anything that you need, you know, you're a single woman, um, you're raising your granddaughter and you know, your daughter's living in your house. You probably may need some physical help. Maybe in your move, I could load your truck. I could do whatever you need. Like I could, my guys could come over and help box things up. Remember, I'm a contractor. I got a lot of employees. She's like, I'm so confused. Like you want to help me, but you don't want to even give me an offer. Like, who are you? Right. And she says, she says to me, what are you, a boy scout? <laughs> like saying it, you know, facetiously. And I said, yeah, actually I am. I'm an Eagle Scout. My parents wouldn't let me get my driver's license till I was an Eagle Scout. So yeah, I'm an Eagle Scout. She's like, whoa, you really want to help me? I go, yeah, I really want to help you. I, don't, I can't buy your house. Love to help you. What do you need? She goes, well, I have this really big problem. And it's one of the reasons why I haven't sold the house yet is, is because I haven't figured out what to do with this problem. I go, okay. Now she's got me super intrigued. Like, what's this big problem? And she says, are you, are you ready for weird? I go, yeah, I'm, I'm down for it. Like, I'm here for it. What, what do you got? So she says, let's go to my backyard. I'm like, all right. So we walk through her house. We go to the backyard. She opens up the sliding glass door and I walk into her backyard and I see three Flemish bunnies. Okay. Flemish bunny. If you look it up, Flemish bunnies get to be the size of a four-year-old child. They are massive, like 65 pounds, humongous bunnies. Like it looks like a toddler in a bunny suit. That's how big these are. And she says, I need to rehome these bunnies. My granddaughter brought them home one day, you know, six years ago. And we thought they were going to be cute little bunnies. And now they've turned into like human sized bunnies. And I can't take these to Oregon. I can't afford to feed them. I need to get this off my books essentially because they're costing me a lot of money, but they've become like family and I need to find somebody that I can trust to take these bunnies. I'm like, how weird has this been? Like I get a call off a postcard. Now I'm all of a sudden in somebody's backyard trying to rehome their bunnies. And if I could, if I could have told myself that that actually is like 99% of this entire real estate business, I would have jumped in this business way faster because that is like every time I'm talking to a seller off market or getting a deep discount or buying their house with creative finance, it's because I'm helping them do something along these lines. So Janie says, I need to rehome these bunnies. Do you know anybody? I go, yeah, I know somebody. So I literally open up my phone. I call my mom and I go, mom, 
you know, I'm 30 years old at this point. So my, I call my mom and I go, hey, mom, I've got Janie Munson on speakerphone. Here's her situation. Can you help me? My mom shows up to the house 45 minutes later in a truck I've never seen before. I had no idea. Still to this day, don't know where that truck came from. Pulls up in a red truck, takes the bunnies, gives me a hug, tells Janie, thank you. And then she takes off. And Janie's like, wow, I have been trying to solve this problem for a year and a half. And every single person that came to this house, none of them asked me how they could help me. And you, not even wanting to give me an offer, decided to help me and not just ask me to help, but like actually follow through within an hour of me asking you, you have solved a problem I couldn't solve in a year. I go, okay, well, have a great day. She's like, wow, you're really not going to give me an offer. <laughs> nope. I, I can't afford your house. You want too much money. Have a great day. Gave her a hug. Walk away. Two weeks later, I get a call. Janie Munson. Pace, today's the day I have to make a decision. I put it on my calendar. I have to make a decision on who I'm selling my house to. And I have come to the conclusion you are the only person I want to sell my house to. And I'm like, wow, I'm so honored. I'm so blown away. But Janie, I can't afford to pay over $165,000, you should take the other offer. She goes, I don't care what your offer is, Pace. I trust you as a human being. And you provided more value to me in um, all of these months of me researching all of these people. 15 people came to my house before you and 15 people came to my house after you. And you were the only person that asked me how you could help me. You were the only person that didn't look at my house and criticize my single pane windows, my poor, my, my roof that was falling apart, my hot water heater, my air conditioning unit is super old and barely hanging on by a thread. And all you did was show me love and um, thank me for being a teacher because you loved your teachers. Nobody, not one person. They showed up and there were their fancy cars. They showed up with their name tags on their shirt. They showed up in their collared shirts and their business cards. You were the only person that showed up as a human being. And she says, I don't care what your offer is. Get the paperwork, come up to my house. Let's get the deal done. So I ended up buying this house for $150,000. People that are listening to this now are like, where'd you come up with 150 grand? Well, I didn't. I got a contract for 150,000 and I sold that contract to Bethany Willis for 175,000. Bethany Willis bought the house for me for 175,000. So I wholesaled my first deal and I made 25 grand for probably three hours worth of work. And in my conversations with Bethany, she was congratulating me. And I said, man, I had no idea like how fun this business is. I get, get to just help people all the time. And she says, Pace, you learned the most valuable lesson in real estate be in, on your first deal. And you should consider yourself lucky. I go, what, what's the lesson? She says two things, same thing, but two different. She's like, I want to say it two different ways. Number one, when you buy a house and you're trying to be an investor, it's never about the house. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. She's like, you didn't even know what to look at. You didn't know what to, how to comp it. All you did was dig into the lady's problem and help her solve and give her the, the service. It wasn't about the house. It was about her as the individual. And if, the fact that it took you one deal to find that out, it took me 10 years to find that out. And once I found that out, my conversion rate tripled, quadrupled, et cetera. And the second way to say this pace is that you found her bunnies. And I was like, wow. She said, think about this. Everybody else was just in the house, criticizing the house, criticizing the house, criticizing the house. Yet you took the extra step to get behind the scene, get into her psyche and ask her to get into her backyard where her real problems were. Nobody was invited into the backyard. Nobody was invited to understand the real problems. You, underst you understand this now that if you find the bunnies of every seller, you will win. And I was blown away. And, um, Here's what happened. I was sending out postcards, generating, generating a lot of leads and um, opening escrow on a lot of cash deals. I was doing a good job. And then my escrow officer, her name is Eileen Brown. She's like, who are you, dude? You've gotten like three contracts in a week. And I was like, yeah, because I know how to find the bunnies. <laughs> she's like, excuse me. And I tell her the story and she's like, okay, so how many leads are you, do you got for every contract? I go, well, that's kind of the problem. I'm generating a lot of leads right now but I can't help everybody. I, I can't find their bunnies or basically their bunnies are locked up. And she's like, what do you mean? I go, they don't have any, a lot of these people don't have equity. They just did a, re, a cash out refi last year. They, they, maybe they bought the house just six months ago. They don't have a lot of equity. They got a job transfer or 
I get a lot of sellers that are just really aggressive on their sales price and they just want to sell at a really high price. And she's like, Pace, those people have bunnies. They're just different shapes and sizes. I can show you how to find those bunnies. It's called subject to and seller finance. And I'm like, you're joking me. Well, what I don't, what subject, what subject, what? She's like, it's called subject to. It's where these people who have no equity have payments on their houses. You can just take over the payments on those houses and then turn those houses into cash flowing properties. And then the tenants that you put in those houses can pay down those mortgages and you can cash flow. And I'm like, wait, what? Wait, I can take over somebody's mortgage? She's like, yeah, it's a different colored bunny, but it is a bunny. It's a problem. Somebody's problem is their bunnies is what you're telling me, right? Pace, I go, yeah. So she goes, go back to all your leads that didn't have equity and your sellers that want too much money. The ones that want too much money are typically seller finance. The people that want that have no equity are subject to. And within my first 30 days of doing deals, I was able to double, triple, and then now quadruple my conversion rate by using these strategies subject to and seller finance. And I learned from Eileen Brown, my, my escrow officer, that I could wholesale these deals. I could fix and flip them depending on you know, the situation. And I could buy and hold them and put them in my portfolio. And if you guys uh, on the podcast, you can't see this, but you can look at my map if you guys are watching this. Our we now have 1,800 doors all over the country. 1,800 doors and every single one of them was purchased with creative strategies. Subject to seller finance, novation agreements, lease options, uh, Morby method, um, all sorts of wrap, you know, wraparound mortgages, all these things that are really cool. And I didn't know what the heck they were. And it was because nobody simply explain them to me until Eileen Brown explained them to me and, and tell the bunny story. And I was like, okay, so the practice of buying discounted real estate and being an investor is finding people who have problems and figuring out how to solve those problems for them so that they have the convenience um, and relief so that they'll give you a discount on their home. Or if they can't give you a discount on their home, you can just take over their payments and solve their problem. And nobody explained that to me. I call my dad, my dad calls me, okay? This is where it ties back in with my dad. My dad calls me, he goes, man, how's this real estate thing going? Man, you broke the curse. Like you got into real estate. I go, man, dad, you wouldn't believe it. He goes, oh, I, I'm, I'm blown away. Your mom just told me the story about these bunnies that she brought home. Like what the hell was that all about? And I go, oh, that wasn't even the cool part, dad. And I start telling him about subject to and seller finance and lease options and all these cool things that I'm doing. And he says, I go, have you ever heard of subject to and seller finance? And my dad says, yeah. How do you think we lived in every single home you grew up in since the day you were born until you were 20 when you moved out? And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? And he says, well, you know, we have 12 kids, Pace. I worked as a CPA in the daytime making $60,000 a year. And then I had to moonlight and bring in cash under the table as a contractor. No bank would give me a loan. So I had to go out and work with sellers to give me, you know, rent to own. And then I learned about just taking over mortgage payments under on subject to, then I started figuring out seller finance. And I said, dad, why did you never, why didn't you like start branching into real estate investing yourself? And he says, because I was too, in, I was too busy installing other people's toilets at their houses. I was too busy trading my time for money. Mm -hmm. And so I, luck, I, I'm lucky. I'm grateful for my parents. I'm grateful for my dad amplifying me to a point where I could break the family curse and actually get into real estate and be the one that changes the trajectory of all of our uh, future generations lives is having true wealth and having houses make money for us rather than we make money by touching houses, which is what I did as a contractor. So the F-150 story ties in where um, I got so good at this. I got so good at creative finance and explaining things to sellers because I would use stories that made, made sense to sellers, just like I just did with the bunny story, right? I, I get so many people call me and they go, hey, Pace, I got a deal. I go, great, tell me about it. And, I go, and they, they go, they're telling me about it. And I said, so what, what are the bunnies? Why would the seller sell to you at a discount? Why would the seller give you a good deal? Why would the seller let you take over payments? Why would the seller seller finance you? What are the bunnies? And these people that think they understand how to get into real estate investing are just looking at random houses on the MLS. Guys, people that are selling on the MLS typically don't have bunnies. They, bunnies are the motivation. Bunnies are the reason why they need to sell to you at a discount quickly, or bunnies are the reason they, they got to let you take over their payments. 
you got to find the bunnies and you got to start where um, the bunnies exist, which would be foreclosure, probate, expired listings, um, people that have long days on market with real estate agents on the MLS. I would never call a deal on the MLS or try and buy a deal on the MLS unless it's been on the MLS for over 90 days. Because now I know that they're going through some pain. They're, they haven't gotten offers. They're having a challenge. That's so easy to see that they have bunnies that I can help rehome. Well, I got so good at this. I got so good at this that I started having wholesalers and real estate agents in town call me and say, I have a lead and we don't know what to do with it because the seller wants too much money. And I would just go on these appointments. And I basically, we, everybody in town call, started calling it the PACE method, which was taking people's dead leads, at least what they called dead leads, and I would go and make money on these dead leads. And I got to a point where I actually liked the dead leads way more than I liked the leads that were willing to sell to me at a discount. I wanted the ones that were impossible because that's where I was making the most money. And I had this seller, I had this, I was a wholesaler, his name is Tim. Tim calls me up one day and he goes, Pace, I've got this seller. And the seller is, she wants $110,000 for this property that me as a wholesaler, I got to offer like 40, 50 grand on this in order to me assi to assign it to a fix and flipper in order for them to have enough meat on the bone to go and sell it for 110. It's worth 110 renovated, but this lady wants 110 right now. I go, okay, great. I love that. That's a great lead for me. He's like, how is that a great lead? I go, because I know how to solve the problem. I know how to identify her bunnies and I know how to liberate and rehome those bunnies and solve her problem. And so I go to this appointment. Su seller's name is Susan and Dale. And this is the first time I used the F-150 story to get a seller to understand what terms were. So I go to the appointment. Tim's there. Susan, Dale, the owners are there. We're in the carport because this property, three bed, two bath house, this property, by the way, if anybody wants to look it up, it's 1906 South 78th place in Mesa, Arizona. I still own it to this day. Um, I, we meet in the carport. There's tenants in the property. So we're sitting there talking basically in the carport. The tenants leave. So we go inside the house. We're now in the kitchen. We're chatting. And I go, so Susan, What's kept you from selling the house so far? Same question I ask every single seller. My team asked every single seller, what's kept you from selling the house so far? She says, well, because everybody's lowballing me. Well, yeah, it's typical. I go, um, I think that's why I was brought here and introduced to you. Um, let, me, let me guess. You're probably getting offers somewhere around 40, maybe $50,000 and um, you're wondering why all these investors are lowballing you. She's like, yeah, that's like exactly the offers I'm getting. How do you know? I go, because if I was going to give you a cash offer, I would give you the same cash offer. And I would then be duking it out with these other investors. So they're not investors, they're wholesalers. And I would be duking it out with other people, trying to compete with them and trying to, you know, throw them under the bus and say, these aren't good people to sell to. I'm a better investor to sell to because I'm honest and I'm trustworthy and I can close faster. It's like, Susan, those advantages, like everybody has those advantages. The reason I'm here is because I'm a superhuman. I can solve your problem at a level that other people can't. She's like, so you're telling me you're not going to give me a cash offer? I go, nope, I'm not going to give you a cash offer because if I was, you would also say I'm going to lowball you. So I'm not going to give you a cash offer. She's like, okay, well, then how are you going to buy my house? I go, well, Susan, if I was willing to come up to $110,000, which is astronomical compared to what everybody else is offering you, would you be willing to give me terms? Susan has no idea what terms are. Most people don't know what terms are. And so I came up with really great, easy stories to tell people to kind of help them understand what terms meant. So I always lead with that. I say, well, would you be willing to give me terms? knowing that the seller will not know what that means and it will cause them to pause and go, uh, terms, which then tease me up to tell me, tell my F-150 story, which I've told a thousand times. My students have told it this a thousand times. People take it from my YouTube videos and everybody has permission to take this story and go use this story to explain things to a seller. So this is what, this is the F-150 story. I go, all right, Susan, let me tell you what terms are. I'm a contractor by trade. That's what I did for a very long time. I had an F-150, world's most popular truck. And this truck hit 320,000 miles. And it was 
a truck we were using that four guys would sit in the truck. They'd go from job to job to job. They'd paint houses. And this truck was a catalyst and a tool to make money for my company. And it got to a point where it's having engine failure and overheating and all sorts of things. And it was actually causing me more headaches than it was giving me benefits. Probably similar to the house that we're talking about right now. Your tenants are giving you a hard time. They're not paying on time. You're constantly dealing with them. And this is where some of her bunnies start coming out. Okay, she has family members renting the house from her, taking advantage of her, and then complaining to the rest of her family about how she's always demanding her rent on time and that she doesn't understand the hardships that they're going through and what kind of Christian is she because she is demanding to be paid every single month. These are bunnies, okay? These are the bunnies that Susan had. So I obviously extracted all of that in the upfront conversations. I already knew that before I went into the F-150 story. So I said, so just kind of similar to what's going on with your house, you've got more problems than the benefits um, and you're looking to offload the property, but you don't want to just get rid of the property. You want to get as much as you possibly can. Well, guess what? I'm no different than you. I decided that I was going to sell this F-150. So I go to Kelly Blue Book, kbb.com, which is the Zillow for cars, basically. Okay. And she says, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, great. Yeah. That's kind of like the Zillow for cars. So I'm starting to tie these two parallels together. And I said, I look at the Kelly Blue Book. I see the truck's worth five grand. And I said, oh, hell no. I'm not selling this truck for five grand. It makes me way more money than that. I'm going to go put this on Craigslist to see if there's any silly idiot that's going to pay 10 grand for it. So I put this truck on Craigslist for 10 grand. And I said, I'm just as belligerent as you, Susan. You want $110,000 for a house that everybody else is offering $40,000, $50,000. You want what you want. Well, guess what? I wanted what I wanted to. But unfortunately, I didn't get any emails. I didn't get any phone calls. I didn't get anybody to even criticize me about my high offer. So three months goes by and I didn't sell the truck. Nobody even messaged me one time. It was just, uh, just way too high. So after those three months are up, my wife comes to me and says, Pace, every morning I have to drive around this truck parked in our driveway. It's not a lot, but I got to kind of watch out for it. I got to worry about it. And then when I come home, I got to do the same thing. Can you sell the truck, please? And I go to my wife, I'm like, sweetheart, I'm not going to go put this truck on Craigslist for five grand. Because if I do, I'm going to get an offer for $3,100. And this person is going to go, I'll give you all cash offer for $3,100. That's what you're going through right now, Susan. Everybody's coming in and lowballing you. Everybody's lowballing you because they want to leave meat on the bone for themselves, as you can understand. And I said, so I, I decided I'm not going to do that. And I told my wife, I'm not going to do it. She says, well, why don't you just take payments? And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so genius. So this is what I did, Susan. I went back to Craigslist and I changed one thing. I said, F-150 will take payments. And within 30 minutes... I had to turn that ad off because I was swarmed and swarmed and swarmed with people. Where are you? I'll come, I'll come and give you $1,000 down right now. Uh, da, da, da. So Susan, did I sell that truck for $10,000? She said, probably. I go, I sold it for $12,500 with $1,000 down, $350 monthly payments for the next several months until it was paid off. And she's like, Wow. Wow, 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 wow. And I go, that is terms. It's where I, the seller, give my buyer terms, okay? Down payment, interest rate, length of time that they're, and I become the bank. So what I'm asking you to do, Susan, is to become the bank. And the gentleman who bought my truck from me gave me $1,000 down. He um, then made monthly payments to me and I got the number I wanted. I made, I made way more money because I was willing to be patient and play the bank. And the best part about it, Susan, I was able to help a family. Hey everyone, it's Clay Fink here. Are you looking for an investment opportunity in a $2 trillion market? Look no further than Atacama, the cybersecurity industry's latest game changer. Atacama has opened its doors to US accredited and international investors alike, already attracting over 5,000 investors and $6.5 million in capital. Atacama's recurring revenue model saw 10X revenue expansion in 2022 alone. 
They have patented technology and large contracts secured, including one with the U.S. Department of Defense. This is a limited time opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a rapidly growing cybersecurity startup. To learn more, simply visit invest.atacama.com slash WSB. That is invest.atacama, A-T-A-K-A-M-A dot com slash WSB. Full disclosure, I have personally invested in Atacama's equity crowdfunding round at a $29 million valuation. Please keep in mind that investments in early stage companies do contain risk. As with any investment, crowdfunding investments do offer attractive potential upside, but they cannot offer any guarantees of a future return. And I was able to help this gentleman who bought my truck. Guess what he did? He was an auto mechanic starting a paint company. He fixed up all the truck issues. He did that himself. And he went and put that truck into operation and he made a lot more money on that truck. So some people might look at him and go, Man, you overpaid for that truck, Jose. No, he did not. Because the value of something is never the purchase price. The value of something is always what you can do with it and what money you can generate from it. So Susan, if you're willing to give me terms that can allow me to go make money on this, I would be willing to come up to your $110,000. She's like, done. What do we got to do? I go, well, you tell me you're the bank. You're the bank of Susan. I'm coming and applying to you. How do I get a loan? How can you sell or finance this house to me? She says, I want $20,000 down in 8% interest. I'm like, okay, that's a problem. Okay, everything's a teeter-totter. Okay, you want a high purchase price on one side so that your one side of the teeter-totter is really high? Well, then if you want a high purchase price, then the other side of the teeter-totter needs to be really, really low. And that would be a low or no down payment or a low or no interest rate. So what do you want? Do you want a high purchase price or do you want a high per, um, down payment? She says, I want a high purchase price. I go, then let's do a no down payment and no interest because you want to sell the house for a, a really high price of 110 grand. She says, I can't do that. I'll give you no interest, but I will, I need a down payment. I go, okay, cool. Why don't we do this? You pay closing costs. Okay, so she paid closing costs on this house. I'll take over your tenants so you don't have to evict your family, right? I, I already knew what I was doing. I knew the problem with her tenants was actually that it was a family member renting from a family member. And the second I took over the property, all of those problems would go away. All of them would go away. Guess what? Those people are still renting the property. They're on time every single month. And it's because they were taking advantage of a family member. That's all it came down to. So me being in that situation was actually better. So I never had to renovate this property, which was cool. And um, so uh, she says, I want, okay, I want $10,000 down. I go, no problem. I'll give you $10,000 down, but here's how I want to do it. Every six months, I will give you five grand above the payments. She goes, okay. So what I did is here, here's kind of how it works. The tenant was paying $1,650 a month. Now they're about $2,000 a month, but they're, they were at $1,650 a month. And the way I structured this deal, which I'll get into in a second, I was netting $1,000 every single month after my payment to Susan, which I'll tell you how I structured my payment to her. After my insurance, my taxes, my vacancy repairs, I was netting $1,000 every single month. So imagine, I go, I'll give you a down payment, but I won't give it to you when we close escrow. I'll give it to you six months later, and then I'll give you another portion of it six months after that. So I accumulate $1,000 in cash flow for six months. Now I've got six grand in cash flow. I take that six grand, pull five grand out of it, hand five grand to her, and that pays down her down payment. Then six months later, I pay another $5,000 out of the cash flow from the property. So I got her closing costs paid for by her, took over the tenant, so no renovation. I got 0% seller finance, and I didn't have to put any money up front. She allowed me to pay my down payment out of the cash flow of the property. I've done this hundreds of times, hundreds of times. And if you're willing to meet the seller at their number, especially in a seller finance situation, sellers that are willing to sell or finance just really want to win on one thing. They want to sell at the maximum amount of money as possible. And so how did I structure the payment to her? My payment to her was $375 a month. Again, going back to the bunnies. The story of the bunnies is this. She says, we want to retire, Pace. We 
are sick of begging our family member to pay the rent. We just want to go and retire and travel around the country in an RV one month here, one month there, one month here, one month there. So what I obviously obtained that information. I waited to utilize that as, am, as ammunition for a later portion of the conversation. And now is the time where I use that information as ammunition. And I said, so what kind of payment are you looking for? She says, I don't know. What, what, what would you pay? And I said, well, how much does it cost you guys to rent a typical RV spot when you guys are traveling around the country? She said, $375. I go, okay, why don't we just set up the payment for $375 so you never, never have to worry about paying another RV spot rental ever again and you and your husband get to go around the country and just travel. She goes, okay, that sounds great. I didn't have to use this fancy spreadsheet. I didn't have to use some magic calculator. I just understood her motivation. I understood what she wanted to accomplish. And I helped find her bunnies and rehome those bunnies, if that makes sense. The F-150 story, I've told this a thousand times. And it breaks seller, it just breaks it down to the most simple version, a vehicle. I took payments on a vehicle. I let somebody pay over the value of that vehicle because they didn't want to use their credit or they didn't have credit. They used very little money down and I won, okay? I won. I sold that truck for two and a half times its value because I was willing to give somebody terms. And so I go around the country and I'm buying houses a lot of times at 91 cents on the dollar, 98 cents on the dollar. I'm paying almost full retail all of the time. But guess what I'm getting? I'm getting a lot of no money down, low money down, very low interest rates. I'm taking over mortgage payments at 2%. I just got a deal in Hawaii um, last week. Two acres on the ocean. Seller let me take over their 2% interest rate. They have a guest house in the back that's already cash flowing. Payments already being made by tenants in the back. Now I got to fill the main house and I'll do an Airbnb there. I'll probably never see that property. You th you'd think at this point, oh, you can go visit all these houses. No, I don't have time for that. We have so many deals that we're buying all over the country. And so Creative finance changed my life. I, I, I didn't have the money to buy these assets. I, I have not had my credit pulled. I have not talked to a lender. I'll give, you, I'll give you a really good example of this. I decided I want to buy a house in Montana on a lake, Kalispell, whitefish area up in Montana. So one of my students, newer students, calls me up and he goes, hey, I'm a real estate agent up here. I'll help you. Find I keep hearing you say you want to have a, a house that you can fish on. You want water you know, flowing through it or you want to be on a lake. I can help you. I go, yeah, but I'm not going to buy anything that's cash. So you got to go find me creative. He goes, oh, there's no creative finance deals up here. It's too ritzy. It's too nice. I go, <laughs> okay. There are literally hundreds of deals everywhere. And so after a couple of Zooms with him and coaching him along and showing him how to go find them, he, here's what he said. He goes, I will go find these, but I want you to also do me a favor and go get pre-qualified for a loan. Okay, cool. So I call his mortgage officer up there in Kalispell. That was about six weeks ago. I have still not got pre-approved because I'm a business owner. I claim nothing on my taxes, right? So she's having a hell of a time getting me pre-approved, even though we make our companies generate millions of dollars. He goes in in three days, finds me 12 properties on seller finance. And he's just like, I'm blown away. I'm blown away that there's that, that many deals out here for seller finance or taking over mortgages. I just wasn't paying attention. I go, no, you just, it's not that you weren't paying attention, it's that you didn't have the information in your head for your head to pay attention for you. It's, it's called the frequency effect, or I call it the, the Tacoma effect. Other people use, use, there's some scientific name for it, but when I bought my first Toyota Tacoma, I thought I was the coolest kid. I was like, I got a Toyota Tacoma. Nobody else has a Toyota Tacoma. And then all of a sudden I'm driving around and I'm like, holy crap, everybody has a Toyota Tacoma. It's the same thing with creative finance. Once you know it's there, you can't unsee it. It's there and it starts popping up and what you focus on expands. And then all of a sudden there's deals everywhere. And we're at a point now where 85% of the deals we do are all creative finance. Only 15% of them do we use cash. 85% of our deals, multifamily, RV parks, land, single family homes, um, uh, storefronts. Come, we're, we're looking at a strip mall right now. We're even buying businesses with creative finance right now. We got a CPA firm that we're negotiating right now. No money down. They will give us a hundred grand the day we close escrow out of their pocket to take over their company. Understanding people's bunnies is what this is all about. Why would a CPA firm 
sell to me with no money down and give me a hundred grand to take over their business on day one. You know why? Is because the CPA has 15 people working underneath him. They have a great business, but now the CPA wants to retire, but he never put anybody in charge. He never built a real business that didn't rely on him. So he's saying, I I'm going to retire. And now this business I put 40 years of my life into is going to die because I didn't know how to operationally build a, a succinct and like a manufacturing line where I could step away and not have to be in this business and I could actually retire. I need to basically pay somebody to take over my business so I can have a check come in every single month through my retirement. Otherwise, this business will implode. So we come along, take over a CPA firm. We put some a COO in place, a, a CFO, and we start running this business. He gives us a hundred grand up front to go hire people. And then all he wants is he says, pay me 10 grand a month until I die. That's that's creative finance, mm -hmm. buying businesses, buying cars, buying houses, apartment complexes. I will never use cash ever again. I, it, it is the only time we use cash is if we're wholesaling or we're fixing and flipping, but to acquire and put things in my portfolio, 100% of it has always been creative finance subject to seller finance or the Morby method. So many good stories there, Pace. I really appreciate your storytelling abilities. It's incredible. I want to get into the book though. So Talk oh, to yeah. me a little bit about, it's called Wealth Without Cash. It comes out in May. I want to hear about what the inspiration was more of what the writing process was like. My co-host, Robert, who you know, wrote a book called, about house hacking. And it sounded like a pretty grueling process talking to him. Just talk a little bit about the inspiration for it, why you wrote it, who it's designed for, and just like what the process was like for you. I don't, I did not like writing a book. And so I ended up having to hi hire a ghostwriter. I'm great at speaking. I'm great at telling yeah. stories. I'm great up in front of a whiteboard on camera, on stage. I'm great at those things, but sitting down and keeping me still is an impossibility. So I hired a ghostwriter to go through and have conversations with me and me tell stories. And he took those and put those into the book. And I even, you know, I just feel like a book just can't do 100% justice of what I want to talk about. So what I did also, and I love video so much, I created a video companion guide that comes with the book. So every single chapter gets three hours of whiteboard videos and stories about deals and why this and terminology. It is a master class of creative finance. The book is basically the appetizer. The video companion guide is just the meat and potatoes. And it is so cool to have gone through that process. It took a year and a half. Um, I still have two more videos that we're still putting together, Mad Dash for the release on May 2nd. And um, it was grueling. It was hard. On, on July 4th last year, when the book was completed, I couldn't even read the book because I was so excited. I, I was like, okay, I, I, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I want to do more. I want to add more information to this. I, and Bigger Pockets, an amazing collaborator, reminded me to simplify, simplify, simplify. So it's only 200 pages. It's really an appetizer into creative finance. And then the video companion guide really gives you a ton of power. And that video companion guide is free when you buy the book, which is really, really cool. That's amazing. I did not know that you did the video companion guide too. So I will yeah. put links in the show notes for that. So um, talk to us about who the book's designed for. Is it for the beginning investor, for someone a little more advanced? What would you say about that? It's definitely not for the advanced. Um, I'd say that there's a lot of things in the video companion guide that are way, 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 way advanced. But the book itself is just an appetizer. It's just there to let you know what these terms are, that these things exist, and then for you to dig a little bit deeper. Um, otherwise, this book, I mean, creative finance is so much more diverse than Burr. It's so much diverse than, much more diverse than cash deals. Um, to put it into perspective, um, I look at like, let's say as a contractor, I'd pull up to a job site and have a truck full of tools and a trailer full of tools and everything you can imagine, jackhammers to, you know, drills and saws and everything you can imagine. A cash offer to me is a hammer. It's all it is, is a hammer. Creative finance is all of the other tools. It is so diverse. It is so deep and so, um, wide that you can go to an appointment and use such a variety of tools that a 200 page book is never going to be able to tell you all of that. So the book is really for beginners to let them know that it exists and that these things are there. And then for them to go out and start doing the research and go onto some of the bigger pockets forums and um, go on to the bigger pockets YouTube channel and listen to some of these videos that I've done um, and give way more in-depth stories. The video companion guide is then 
basically 30 hours of just unbelievable. Like, I'll give you a good example. When I did the video companion guide, I was like, I want a live audience. So I have a studio. I brought in 15 people into the live audience. And the day that I press record on the first video for the video companion guide, I get a text message from one of my sellers. Homeowner, lives in, lives in Boston, has a house in Boston. And he says, Pace, um, we've been negotiating for the last couple of weeks. I'm in Phoenix for a convention. I think your offices are here in Phoenix. Any chance we could meet up and finalize the deal today? I go, yeah, but I'm recording in my studio with an audience. Do you mind just stopping by here? And he goes, no problem. So literally the first video you will watch is a seller walking into my studio and going, all right, how are we going to do this deal? And for an hour and a half, I broke down subject two for him and I gave him an offer, shook hands. I bought his house right there on live camera only to be seen in the video companion guide. So an hour and a half appointment face to face with the seller talking real live. Here's the address. Here's the numbers. Here's why I would buy it. It, it, it That one video alone is a masterpiece. The book could never do that. And so mm -hmm. the book is an appetizer that hopefully leads you into the main course meal, which is the video companion guide. That's really awesome. I'm eager to look into all of that. I wanted to talk a little bit about your why. Early in the book, you talk about the seven layers of why. Can you yeah. explain to us that idea? And then I also wanted to hear what your Pace Morby's why is. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, somebody took me through this practice. Actually, it was Dean Graziosi when I became friends with Dean. And Dean says, um, what, um, what do you want to do? And I, I tell him, I want to do, I want to become a billionaire. And he goes, why? I go, well, because I can provide for my family. And I, then I, I pause and I was like, so I can provide for my family. He goes, okay, but why? And oh my gosh, what a practice of depth of like really getting into this. And then you really realize like, wow, okay. Um, I actually don't know my why. So when you go through the seven layers of why, it really forces you to get deep and deep and deep. And you have to stop. If you have not gotten to your seventh layer, then you truly don't understand your why. Okay. Now for me, my why is, I was, put, I was put on this earth by a creator, whether it's God or the universe or whatever. I was put on this earth to help my, my um, other mankind. And I would be wasting my life if I was not obtaining resources and experiences and then turning around and giving those back. My why is that this is my purpose. I was put on this earth as an instrument, as a tool, as whatever, to help other people go and find their why, find their purpose, and find financial freedom. And so uh, the reason I do all the things I do is because I'm supposed to, I'm required to, it's my responsibility. It is my duty. And I am, I'm trying to live up to my, my creator's requirements of me. I love it. I love it. I, um, I wanted to get into a little bit more of just, there's so much to creative financing, but, and you've kind of touched on, uh, you know, some of this as, as you've, have you've told some of your stories, but for our listeners that have no idea about subject to and seller financing, just at a high level, what are the differences between those two? The two differences between a, um, subject to and seller finance means, um, subject to means there's an existing debt on the um, asset. So the asset is a house, could be a car, could be a business, right? So let's, let's take a business, for example. If I go to buy a business and I'm talking to a, a company and they go, buy us for $2 million. And I go, great, what, is, what do your books look like? And they go, well, we have an SBA loan for $2 million. Okay. I go, great. So I'll just, how about I just take over your SBA loan and I just make payments on the SBA loan and you walk away. That's called subject two. I literally took over payments on their debts and I took over the, the asset by transferring the ownership into my name. That's subject two. Same thing with a car. I buy cars subject to, I go to a car owner and I go, looks like you're having a hard time selling that on Craigslist. It's been on Craigslist for a hundred days. Would you let me just take over your payments and I can just take over car payments. Same thing with a house. Hey, Looks like your house has been on the market for 120 days. Can I just take over your payments? Subject two is taking over an existing debt that is already there. And the benefit of that is that you're getting, you don't have to go through an application. No, you don't have to talk to a bank. Nobody check, cares about your credit. Nobody cares about your job history. Nobody cares about your tax returns. None of that. Thousands of deals we've done. Nobody's ever asked for any of those things. So that's subject two. Seller finance means... Let's say I go to somebody who has a car in Craigslist and I call them up and I go, can I take over payments? They go, oh, I don't, I don't have any payments. I, I own this free and clear. 
I go, okay, well then seller finance it to me. Okay. Seller finance means that the thing that I'm buying is paid off and the seller is going to finance me. This is why we call it seller financing. The seller is financing me and they are becoming the bank. So I have to then work out an agreement with that seller like I did with Susan. I go, okay, what down payment do you want? Okay. And the four parts to that are purchase price, down payment, interest rate, and length of time they're willing to take payments. And so that's seller financing, finding things that are paid off free and clear. And by the way, a lot of people don't realize this, but 40% of all the homes in the, in the United States are paid off free and clear, 40%. Hmm. So, so you go look at 10 houses, it's like 38.9%, for basically 40%. A lot of people don't realize that. So when you're calling sellers and they just want too much money, that's typically a seller finance situation. Um, now, um, I, the way I de de determine these very simply is I say, subject to typically has pain there's some sort of debt, there's pain there. There, there, there's pain that you have to solve. They're going through foreclosure, they can't afford the payments, something is going on, okay? Seller finance is typically gain. They are looking for gain. They, they, all they wanna do is win. They want a high purchase price. And so subject to and seller finance are different, not only in the sense that subject to has a debt attached to it and seller finance is paid off free and clear, but it's also different in the sense that the people you are buying the house from on subject two are going through a really hard time. The people that you're buying on seller finance are typically the opposite. They're very well off. They don't need the money. They just want to make sure that they sell at the highest possible price. Um, like I've got a 43 unit in San Angelo, Texas, a multifamily I bought last year on seller finance. Seller Mario is like, I'll seller finance you, but I want 3 million bucks. Okay. I go, okay. Um, you would probably get a cash offer for this for like 2.7, maybe 2.6. I'll pay you 3 million. And the seller, Barney was like, really? You'll pay me 3 million? I go, yeah, but on terms, I'll give you no down payment, 3% interest, and I want fifty year a 50-year term. Mario says, okay, great. He wins. He got $3 million on his books that he'll collect payments for for the next 50 years. And some people go, why would a seller do that? Typically, the people that are asking why would a seller do that are not well off enough to truly understand why a seller would do that. Mm -hmm. Sellers are well off in seller financing. If you go on my YouTube channel, I have an interview with Mario, the guy that sold me the 43 unit with 50 year note, no down payment, 3% interest. And he gives us 19 reasons why he sold to me on seller finance. 19 reasons. Tax benefits. Avoids, he avoids real estate agents. No surveys had to be done. He didn't have to do any repairs. He got way more money. He added interest to the way more money he got. So not only did he get $300,000 more, he also will get interest on top of that, that he'll end up making $5 million, $6 million on that total asset over the length of 50 years by becoming the bank. He doesn't have to deal with tenants anymore, right? Now the seller finance, uh, the, the agreement that him and I put together called a note, he has a note that is secured against real estate. It's the safest investment. I mean, what's he going to do with the 3 million bucks if I gave it to him in cash? He's going to go do what? He wants to retire. He doesn't want to go invest in something he has to manage. So becoming the bank alleviates the need for him to manage a property anymore. You don't call the bank when the toilets go bad. You don't call the bank when the roof goes bad. So I'm upgrading these landlords into the lender and I'm making their life really easy. So seller finance, free and clear, subject to has a debt attached to it. Do you view your role primarily in trying to do these deals as one, as an educator? Is that one of your biggest things that you're trying to do? It seems like in many cases, that's your primary role. It is the primary role. It's one of the reasons if you guys look in my backdrop behind me, you'll see um, that I have a gentleman over my shoulder right here. His name is Big Boy. He's from a rap group called Outcast, And Cool thing is I own real estate with Big Boy now, which is nice. But more importantly, the reason why I have him over my shoulder is to remind me that my job is to be a storyteller. I tell stories to sellers. I tell stories to real estate agents. I tell stories to private money lenders all day long because telling stories gets people to understand the concept of what I'm doing and what I'm trying to accomplish. So yeah, I mean, sellers don't know what subject to in seller finance is. That's my job to explain it to them in a third grade language. So instead of me being so high level, telling a story about an F-150 and taking over payments, you know, like I, I could tell you one of the best stories I ever, I could ever tell you, this is about a two minute story. Best story I could ever tell you. 
I have a camera guy that does my YouTube videos, gets hired, and he comes into my studio day one, and he says, man, I'm working for the sub two guy. I'm so excited. I'm working for the sub two guy. And one of my other camera guys says, dude, I've been here, I've been here for a year. And you come in here, you think you know what sub two is? You don't know what sub two is. And the new uh, camera guy's name's Jose. He says, yeah, but it does, I don't need to know. I go, dude, you need to know. If, we're, if you're going to be my camera guy, you need to know what subject two is. And he goes, okay, tell me what subject two is. So I look at him and I go, okay, you're a camera guy. I'm going to explain this to you in terms that you'll understand. He says, okay. I go, what's a, what's a camera and a light, uh, like a light that you would really want as a camera guy? He goes, oh, I want the, A7, I want the Sony A7S III. I want the G Master lens. I want the Aperture uh, D100, D120 light. That's my perfect combo. Okay, cool. Watch me. So I have him come over to my computer. I go on Craigslist and I go and I type in these terms and I find somebody has a similar combo of camera equipment that they're selling. And I uh, make three phone calls. The first guy says no. Second guy says no. But the third guy says yes to this. I go, hey, my name is Pace Morby. I am a uh, wedding videographer and I'm hoping to build my business, but I need some help. I see you're selling a bundle. I want to buy that bundle. I won't even negotiate on price, but I need you to let me make payments on that bundle of camera equipment. And the guy goes, okay, so you're not going to, you're not going to negotiate on my price. I go, nope. I imagine everybody else is trying to lowball you 500 bucks, 700 bucks, whatever it is. He goes, okay, great. Um, can you send me some of your stuff so I can at least know you know what to do with the equipment? I go, no problem. I go, here's my YouTube channel. So I send him my YouTube channel. Guy goes, okay, when do you want to come pick it up? Guy sells me a $3,800 camera, a, a few thousand dollars worth of lenses, a thousand dollar lighting kit, all of this with a hundred dollars down. And he said every time, and I set it up where I go $300 monthly payments as I take that equipment and go make money with it doing wedding photography. I'm not a wedding videographer, but that was the story I told the, the seller to understand why I needed the, the stuff on terms. So Jose, I hang up the phone. Jose looks at me and he goes, you just bought my dream equipment on payments. I go, yep, that's called subject to or seller finance. And that's what I do with houses. He's like, wait, you can do that with houses? I go, yeah, you can do it with anything. You want a boat? I just bought an RV with it. I just, you know, I bought RV parks, mobile home parks. What do you want? What do you want? You name something and I can buy it with terms. And Jose goes and gets the camera. He gets the lighting, gets the lenses, does all that stuff. And, um, he goes and shoots, you know, side projects and he makes that $300 monthly payment to that guy that now is no longer the seller. He's now the bank and Jose makes a $300 monthly payment to him. And if I tried to explain that to Jose in housing terms, it would have taken an hour. But because I explained it to him in camera terms, he immediately got it. And so my job when I'm talking to sellers or agents is to build rapport, get information about who they are. I, you know, if I have a seller that is a third grade teacher, I tie in stories about a crayon, you know, okay, well, here's what we could do with this. And here, I tell a different story. I try to tie it into their life and I don't go into them saying subject to seller finance, novation agreements. I don't talk about notes and deeds of trust and wraparound mortgages. They don't know what these terms are. So I have to tell stories that meet them on their level. It's great. The book goes into all of that. I highly encourage people to check it out when it comes out. Um, Pace, how can people find out about you, reach out to you? What's the best way for them to do that? You've got a lot of different uh, platforms that you're on. I'd say go to YouTube. Um, you know, we get about 4 million views a month on our YouTube channel. So people seem to like it. And, um, you know, DM me on Instagram. I'm the one that actually DMs and does all the stuff. So um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I uh, really enjoy the book and uh, best of luck with it. Thank you so much. Patrick, you've made a million dollar mistake too. You just don't know it yet. Right. And so is everybody else. The time value of money is important. And that's something that people don't really think about. No competition. If you do something different, nobody's going to do that stuff. Nobody's going to make an option loan. You know, nobody's going to call the We Buy Houses guy. Do something different.